shapes of a size that is not really controlled by the data but rather by the shape of the area that you want to visualize. Um, and so this is like a technique that was published at Infibus a while ago. These are called necklace maps and I handed out um, like a sheet with instructions. Like you have two different uh, graphs on there. You have a necklace map of illegal immigrants in the United States and the migration in the Netherlands. Uh, and so the next uh, five to ten minutes please talk to like a partner um, and try to answer those questions and then like make your usual analysis of these visualizations. Thank you. 
scale proportionally to the number of immigrants that are illegal immigrants that are living in a state. Um, and so let's take a step back. What are the marks and channels that are being used here? Please raise your hands. The circle, sorry? Are the marks, yes, um, that, that's correct. Other marks? That's the channel, the size is the channel. Uh, other marks? The, sorry, what's that? The map. The map? Yes, so the shapes, like the shapes of the states. Uh, so the map is also a channel, uh, a mark, sorry. What are the channels? We had. The size of the circles. The size of the circles, and the other one? The color. And so what does the color encode? Is there a, a relation between? Yeah, so the color here is really like a label only. Like what does the position of the circles encode? They're not arbitrarily positioned, right? I think maybe the region in the West, that the, the New England section, Midwest and West, West side and East side? Yeah, yeah, that, uh, implicitly, but more explicitly. Like it's a little, it's not a very precise measure, right? But uh, the, they essentially nest a couple of circles or arches on this map and then they position the circles on the circumference of the circle as close as possible to the state that it's associated with, right? So we have Texas, which actually fits into Texas. Uh, we have Arizona, which fits into, uh, into Arizona, but Nevada, for example, is as close as possible uh, to its circle, but it actually doesn't overlap. And so what problem are they trying to address here? Like what would be the obvious alternative? To put the circles in on the state itself. Exactly, and why? Why would that be a problem? Because some states are too small. Exactly. So if you look at Rhode Island over here, the circle for Rhode Island is a lot bigger than Rhode Island itself. Um, and and then there is the neighboring Massachusetts, the neighboring Connecticut, and so you couldn't really place all of those next to each other. So <laughs> this technique is really not particularly relevant if you have enough space. Uh, like if you only have a couple of, let's say, states, and you have enough space to put those circles in, into them, but if you have a map like this, um, then, um, then like laying them out in this way is a potential solution. Um, what is going on in the second map here? Like, do we have extra marks and channels? Yes. Yes, which ones? Arrows. Okay, the arrows are in the marks, and what, what is the channel here? The width of the, of the edges of the arrows encodes how many people are migrating from one area to the other one. And the circle size encodes the size of the population in the first place. It's not particularly surprising. Um, the bigger circles, the bigger regions in the Netherlands also have uh, like the big arrows associated with them. Um, so what are kind of like some trends that we can see? We see, like unfortunately my um, Netherlands geography isn't great enough to tell you the names of those uh, areas, but uh, set age seems to be, there's a lot of people moving out of that area and not a lot of people moving into it, right? Um, okay, so, uh, do you find this visualization effective? I see somebody like say yes, some say no. Comments? Anybody have like any, any opinions? So for the chart on the left, I feel like um, it might be better to do a hybrid version where you can simply place the circles on the states where possible, mm -hmm. and where not you use the necklace. Yeah. That would make it a lot easier to map the labels to the states yeah. as well. I feel like it's effective if you're looking for a particular state. So if you're like, I want to see the size of Utah, you can find it pretty easily um, if you know where the state is. But it doesn't, it, you have a hard time showing an overall, like, which, which one is biggest. Like, yes, in California, you know, it's hard to tell yeah. the world trends. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it looks like you can make relative comparisons, but there's no actual data as to how, how many 
Yeah, so there's actually leg legend missing here, right? So that's a big problem. Uh, I feel like the sheer number of colors are confusing. Looking at it, it's like it's, there are duplicates in colors. Yeah, many actually. Kansas and Florida and Indiana all have the same color, right? So they're, they're using color for labeling. And like, what would be, like, if you wanted to avoid any collisions of these circles, what could you do instead? Use a gradient color, probably. What do you mean? Probably like a uh, like a life map. But I, I, if you want to use the circles, I mean, it's the combination of circles and colors. Using like, some gradients and that. Yeah. So the other one, the other approach that you could take is you could essentially have like a force-based system here, right? That you try to place every circle as close to its state as possible. Um, and if it doesn't fit into the state, or it, it, or it has to be pushed away, you could simply like have a label pointing inwards. And then you might not have to use color. And so you would probably be fine in the west here, where the states are big and the population isn't that big. And then you would have a lot of labels, uh, or a lot of like arrows pointing to the states, which is kind of like what, what we see in a lot of maps, like where like Rhode Island uh, is pointed out explicitly. Um, so, like, other opinions about this visualization? Have you seen something like this before? This paper is a couple of years old, so that also tells us that this hasn't been adopted much, right? Um, and, and one of the problems that the technique has, it's, it's, it's kind of quite manual, uh, so you actually have to tell the algorithm where to put the circles. The algorithm then will figure out where to place the uh, where to place the uh, so disks on top of the circles, but it doesn't figure out how to place the, uh, these, these large, larger circles in the first place. Here's another example and like, a comparison of where this such a visualization technique can be. Like, this is another technique that we're talking about later, where we rescale the area. Um, and so like, one of the problems of rescaling the area is obviously uh, that if the data is small in certain areas, like this is internet users in Africa, uh, if the data is small, essentially we kind of lose all of the uh, geography here. Of course, here we keep the geography and we see that internet usage is really almost non-existent in uh, much of Central Africa. Okay, so that kind of leads us right into cartograms. And cartograms is also what you're using in your uh, homework this time. Or, um, so again, we're trying to uh, balance the size versus data effect um, that we've discussed at the beginning of the last lecture. So where we have this disproportionality of like the pixels um, that are of a certain type and the data that corresponds to it. So like here, the actual data proportions compared to the uh, pixel proportions. And you can see uh, that there's quite a difference here. So what if we just change the size on the map? Uh, essentially try to find a compromise between geospatial accuracy and quality of data encoding. Like that's the promise of cartograms. So here is a, like a hand-drawn example of um, the number of Elvis concerts that Elvis gave in the various states across the, the U.S. Um, rescaled um, in attendance per state. Um, and so you can see that he gave a lot of context in, in Tennessee, in Texas, uh, also in California, but he didn't come much to Utah. Um, and so, what do you think about this visualization? What's that? It's a nice one. It's a nice one. What, like, do you think the compromise between geospatial context and the size of the uh, areas here is, is appropriate? I mean, to know the state, state size, it's a pretty good knowledge. You know, like, how big each state is. So it's, you can kind of use it as a you know, information to kind of connect the... Yeah, so I think it's, like, it's neat, it's engaging, but of course, whenever you rescale an area by data uh, and you kind of like don't have a good proportion of area to data, um, then it gets a little tricky. As you can see here, like there's a big white chunk here. Um, and so we get a good sense of what is going on. Also, what's the problem of these irregular shapes? Do you think there were more concerts or more attendees in California than in Tennessee? It's hard to compare when the, there is a difference like that in the shape. Exactly. So this, it, this is kind of a downside, and it's like it ties back into what I said at the beginning of the last lecture uh, that you should only use geospatial 
uh, like a geospatial layout if the uh, geospatial layout is actually paramount. Here's another example that uh, scales the distance by data, in this case, travel time on an airline. Um, and so we can see that, um, well, what, what kind of examples do we have here? It looks like there, is a pretty, there are pretty good connections from Los Angeles to the Texas area, like from California to Texas, uh, for example. And so this is basically like if I didn't if I didn't label have any labels here, you might not be able to recognize that this is the United States, right? <laughs> so this is like very very abstract already, and, and yeah, it's tricky. Um, this is kind of like um, well, not quite what you're doing in your homework, but um, a, a little bit more like what you're doing in your homework. Um, like in a homework, we're actually using color and regular shapes, which is even easier. But here, um, this guy uh, used, and that's clearly not 2016. Um, I forgot what it was, but it was, I think, 1916. 1916. Because Austrian Hungarian Empire does not exist anymore. <laughs> Uh, so here, this is a world population map in 1916, um, and like, here they use rectangular shapes to represent the populations, and they, do, they also still kind of retain some of the context. So it's a little bit similar to the necklace maps to some degree, uh, but they kind of give up the explicit spatial context. What do you think about this representation? I like it much more than the Nicholas one. Yeah. But also you lose out on the entire map feeling of it. Yeah, so you lose it, you lose all of the specific spatial information, right? You essentially have a grouping by continents. Um, and not much more here. But I also do like this visualization. Um, the regular shapes help us also to see uh, the differences uh, better. So we can see that the Chinese Empire had a bigger population than the Indian Empire. Uh, we can see that the United States was really small compared to what it is now, like with only 90,000 people. Um, and then almost like Germany being almost the same size as the United States, which is Germany at this time had 64 million people. Now there's about 80 million people. Uh, in Germany, uh, the United States at that time had 90 million people and now there is about 300 million people. So uh, these, these things have changed quite a bit. Uh, but I really like this and this is from the time and of course this is hand drawn. Um, here is a, a, a recent world population map. Um, interesting to see here is um, Canada is only a sliver along the border. Uh, which also makes sense from where people live in Canada. And the same, Russia is only a sliver uh, uh, on top of uh, China here. Um, and here's an example of um, a New York Times article that um, lets you do these things for different, uh, for different aspects. So here we have um, what your global neighbors are buying, how much we are spending, um, for different uh, articles. So here we have, let me zoom in a bit. We have clothing and footwear right now, and you can see that the Americans spend a lot of money on clothing and footwear, but Indians, for example, don't spend a lot of money on that. Um, if we switch over to electronics, uh, we can see that people generally spend less on electronics than they spend on clothing. Uh, the alcohol and tobacco suddenly sees Europe rise. <laughs> So uh, Americans don't seem to smoke and drink as much. Uh, household goods, like that's the second and third lawnmower in the United States probably. Uh, and then recreation, and you can suddenly see that um, Japan has actually increased quite a bit uh, here. And so what do you think about this visualization? Like, I do like the individual ones, right? But I, the comparison is really hard. Uh, like I, I really would be interested in getting a better sense of like where do the countries spend their majority of their money on and here I have to switch between them and then manually have to uh, consciously have to track okay how are these countries behaving right now and so this is a little tricky but generally this is a nice visualization and this is from 2008 um, so uh, the basic idea of the next technique here is to really like take the shape of the world and distort it uh, 
and to try to be as faithful to the uh, to the shape itself, but distort it by uh, by the like the data that you want to map on top of it. So this is just the the world in geography uh, in, ge in its geographical dimensions, and now this is rescaled to population. And we see, of course, like the uh, India and China here being much bigger, and Brazil being about the size it looks uh, for real. So like South America seems to be pretty faithfully. Uh, transitioning, but here we see the same thing with Russia being tiny, Canada being tiny, um, and so on. Uh, here this is the, th uh, the same uh, map for GDP, uh, and we can see that this is now like almost unreadable, right? Uh, especially here in like uh, Central Asia, um, it's, it's really hard to see what is going on in Africa, like, you wouldn't even be able to read an individual country. <laughs> Child mortality, you see that the child mortality in industrialized countries is pretty low. Uh, greenhouse emissions, uh, Kerry versus Bush. Uh, so what do you think about these maps? I think they make an interesting point, right? Uh, but they kind of, uh, like, it's interesting to look at the map like this and to see where, they, where those uh, countries are placed, but it's not a, like a super faithful data visualization, right? Um, so you could do this in a, in a better way, but of course they have a quite, quite uh, interesting dramatic effect. Um, so especially if you look at greenhouse emissions, and you can see where those greenhouse emissions are, um, and so on. Um, and so if you want to learn more, there's like a link um, on the slides to the actual visualization technique. Uh, and this is again using shapes um, for all of those different districts um, in the United States for the Bush versus Kerry race. Um, but um, here, like the geospatial context is really like only very vaguely represented. Okay, so next I wanted to talk about flow maps. Um, flow maps are like probably like in high school you have probably had these like big rollout maps where your geography teacher has shown you like how people have migrated and so on. And this is what we're talking about uh, when we talk about flow maps. So some flow between geospatial locations. So this is here an early flow map, uh, the transportation of passengers in Ireland. So you can see that like um, the uh, width of these, uh, of these like flows here corresponds to how many people travel uh, to and from Dublin. So you can see that this here is like the most important uh, most important path into Dublin uh, compared to like others that, are, that go up to the north that are not as important. Um, you have probably seen this one. Uh, this is often like hailed as the best uh, infographic ever made. Uh, this is by Charles Minard from 1869 and it shows uh, Napoleon's march in Russia. I think I have uh, kind of like explained this in my introductory slides uh, already, but just to recap, like what, what happens here is like we have geospatial context of how Napoleon's army marched from Europe to Russia to Moscow, and the width of these uh, uh, of these these um, let's say flows here um, encodes how big the army was, and you can essentially see very well that uh, they actually didn't lose a lot of people. In, in the actual fight on Moscow, but instead they lost a lot of people uh, on the way and on the way back, so that only a tiny sliver of the soldiers that were in Napoleon's army came back um, alive to France. And it also juxtaposes it with other data like the temperature on the retreat that kind of like highlights why there's so many people who perished. Um, here is a, a visualization for the um, for effect of the US Civil War on the cotton trade, so you have um, the trade before from England to the United States, you can see that there is like a very, very dominant pattern of like, cotton trade between the US um, to Great Britain and to other parts of Europe. But after the Civil War, you can see that um, uh, the trade to the United States essentially died down and instead the trade to Asia uh, intensified significantly. Um, here is a visualization of, let's see what it is. Works. Oh no. Oh well. Um, 
So this is a visualization of uh, immigration paths between different um, areas in the United States. So this is interactive. You can hover over any area that you want to. Um, and so here I've, I've highlighted Plymouth County, Massachusetts, and I'm looking at where people are moving. Um, and so uh, here the intensity of the uh, ribbons, or is probably well, the the color like the color intensity of the destinations probably encodes, um, encodes the the data. However, like this is a non-spatial representation of the same uh, of the same kind of data. Um, so here we kind of like can interactively select and see this specific geospatial context. Here we have a New York Times visualization of um, people like uh, who, people who live in, in Utah, where they're from, but even across time. And so you can see from 1900 to 2012, uh, the majority of people uh, who live in Utah were actually also born in Utah. Um, and then we see that like in the 1900s. Uh, the majority of immigrants were about born outside of the United States, which kind of is taken over by other states in the West and California and Idaho um, as we go along. And these are uh, these ribbons. Um, they are in some way like ranked uh, by their size. It doesn't seem completely faithful because we have Idaho here, um, but uh, they they're supposed to be like ordered and, and essentially like ch crossing over when they uh, change in rank order. Um, well, um, and this is actually a pretty neat visualization. You can look at uh, at various states uh, states, and you can see these trends um, across uh, all of the U.S. states. And they have also done some smart aggregation here. Uh, because um, they, you, they don't like show you all of the 50 states if the, if they, uh, if, if they can group them uh, based on the regions where people are moving from they do that so move to other states in the west move to other states in the south and we can switch between migration into and out of so you can see that Californians tend to stay in California but other people tend to uh, move into California and so we see uh, this trend that people uh, like internationals um, made up a big percentage of immigrants um, in the 1900s, but then uh, it, it dipped in the 60s and now we're back again at the levels of the 1900s, for example. Uh, and you can see that the migration patterns, like the big Midwestern migration to California, is kind of slowing down in terms of percentages. Um, and you can scroll through other states um, and you can look at the, like, at the immigration and at the um, emigration from those states. So compared to those two charts where I had the big map with the explicit links um, and something like this, what do you think, which is the better representation of this data? This one. Why? I mean, you have a high level picture, then you can drill down and kind of move around and get whatever data you need from it. Yeah, and also what did the other visualization show us? It shows only one time point, right? And because we're not using the geospatial context here, uh, we have actually a lot more space um, to show how that changed over time. So we can show a lot more data by giving up the geospatial context um, and, and representing it um, with those, those ribbons here. So I do like this visualization quite a lot and it's, it's fun to play with and you can also like, click on any of those states and if you click on Utah, like um, people who are living in Utah were born like 62% in Utah um, and people who uh, moved out of Utah moved either to California, to Idaho, to other states in the West. So like Utahns like to seem to like to stay uh, on the western side of the United States and don't usually move into the east. Like Northeast is really tiny for example. Um, I do like this uh, visualization here. This is a flow chart that shows us the uh, rail freight tonnage, uh, how many uh, how many how many tons of freight are transported um, along certain rail tracks. So we here we have a geospatial context that is pretty precise, and the width of the of these uh, routes here corresponds to the overall volume. And we see that there is like a massive uh, a massive um, gravitation towards like the Midwest here, which is where a lot of coal is being shipped around. And this is from this um, 
uh, Maps of American Infrastructure, which is really like a really great um, piece in the, in the Washington Post. Um, so there's a lot of interesting maps in here. I just picked the freight one because it's the only one that really does something with data and the other one mainly shows us locations. So bridges in need of repair um, and so on. So this is pretty informative. So I recommend that you look through that. Um, here we have, uh, um, anybody want to guess what, what I'm showing here? <laughs> if you know what it is, it's easy to recognize, but this dot here is Paris. Um, and it's flight patterns into and out of Paris. Um, and they are actually live tracked. And this is a, an interactive system where like, flights, of course, are in three dimensions. So this is like live tracking um, of, or like, it's not live tracking, but it's actual flight data um, sped up. Um, but what is nice about the system is that you can like, do various filters, uh, various brushes, and like dig into individual flights. And so here, like this also shows us this is a very flexible system. I can map anything to an X and the Y coordinate. Um, uh, I can map anything to a color. Um, and so here, altitude is, ma is mapped to color. Now that it's turned off, now altitude is mapped to the Y axis. And so here you can now see like the flight path, these like discrete heights at which planes travel, and then going down into airports. Um, and you can also do this dynamically here. So now this guy is plush brushing all of the flights that came from the, uh, the Atlantic. And you can already see that the majority here land in Paris. Um, and here you can see like how they come down from these flight paths. Uh, so this is a pretty neat system. Um, and these kinds of like uh, three-dimensional data are, are tricky to visualize. Uh, of course, what we're missing here is like the labels, right? So, if I didn't tell you that this was Paris or France, you still wouldn't know what you're looking at. Uh, but it's still a pretty neat system. Um, this is like one of my favorite uh, papers on, on uh, geospatial flow visualization. Like, um, I think this really is one of the smartest ways of thinking about this. Like, what do you, uh, you, you kind of like have both uh, the exact geospatial layout here. Like I think this is also migration between those different states. But then, like, uh, similar to the system that I just showed you, you can highlight regions and you only see the flow between those regions. But then if you say, oh, the geospatial context isn't that important, I can simply aggregate that away, you can transition between uh, a network like this to an abstract network like this. So you can see that within the Washington area, like there's a lot of migration or a lot of people moving around within the Washington area. And then we see that between Washington and Arizona, we have about an equal, uh, um, an equal transition between people moving in and moving out. We see that a lot of people move from New York to Florida, probably like um, people when they're retired move to Florida. And, and there's also, of course, people moving within Florida and so on. And so this is really, a very smart way of thinking about what is the important piece of information and giving users the power to, to represent it. And they also know, use these little spaces here to show us data about, um, uh, about what we see in those regions. So histograms, parallel coordinates plots, scatter plots, or even tree maps. And so this is very flexible. Let me show this briefly. The affected ranges in the attribute view are updated. Selections can also be controlled with the centered widgets. We can also set ranges for non-projected attributes. Now we add another selection. Initially, edges within a selection and between selections are shown. 
These edge attributes can be changed similar to the node attributes and are treated as a nominal edge attribute. Here we show some examples of enabling and disabling different edge types, such as between and background edges. Now we also filter the second selection on a non-projected attribute and rename both selections. The selection labels are also shown in the overview boxes. By changing the projection, all selection boxes are updated to the defined ranges. Note that earlier set Okay, so you get the idea. This is like a super flexible system for data exploration. Of course, it's not something that you would give to uh, an end user necessarily. Okay, um, next I wanted to talk a little bit about data-driven maps. Um, so the idea here is don't use a map to render on top, but let the data make up the map. Um, a simple example, um, it, like what, what's happening here is that we don't show any, um, any like, um, borders or um, we don't even show where there's land and sea. What we show is simply dots um, that are geolocated. And if you have enough of those dots, you usually can like, make a nice map as you've seen in the last example and as you see here. Here is a dot for every zip code in the United States. And magically, uh, geolocating every zip code in the United States makes up a pretty nice shape of the map. Here is a, a, a map for every person uh, in uh, the northeast region around Boston. And so, even though you don't have um, data here, what is, uh, where are cities, where, where does the ocean start, you can see pretty clearly um, the structure of the geography, and it, these are pretty impressive pictures. Um, this is a map that connects every zip code to the subsequent zip code. Um, and so suddenly you get uh, even like you can actually start to see uh, the boundaries between states. Um, this is a map of taxi drop-offs in New York City. Um, again, uh, without any background map or any background structure. Um, and you can see very clearly that lots of people are being dropped off um, in Manhattan, um, and um, in, in certain like regions. Um, this is a map that is, does is a little bit similar to what we what I showed you just earlier with this aggregate uh, aggregate float um, visualization. But this is also like just using these particles. So let me show you this video quickly. <laughs> Project Sandance is all about data visualization. How do we make sense of all the massive amounts of data around us? We use principles of information visualization to make it easy to understand the data and see the patterns within the data. So let's take a look at this data set here. These are actually 50,000 counties. But there's information, there's, there's structure in this data. So if we actually map it onto a map, we can actually see that structure showing up. And when we actually shift to a histogram, the motion really helps you understand the data. And if we switch back to that, where they go back to. So we're going to actually look at some results from the recent election. So here what I'm going to do is map onto each county how they voted. And you can see actually the blue counties and red counties. And it looks pretty extreme. But actually it's much more nuanced than this. So if we look at a different palette here, you can see that, uh, yes, it's blue and red, but it's not quite so extreme on either case. And in fact, we can even break this apart and actually look at nine different graphs. Here are the most extreme on one side, the most extreme on the other side. So if we actually select a point over here and we get some information about it, we can see that that was Texas. So that's how I look at elections, but there are a lot of other things that we can look at besides elections. So we can look at per capita income. So here's the per capita income, and you see a big swath of red across the country. If we actually kind of looked at that in the histogram here, you can see that there are very few counties that have a high per capita income, lots that have a much lower area. So we're interacting with this in a very natural way. So the idea here is that every item is represented as a pixel, and what they're doing is just rearranging those pixels according to various rules and coloring them according to various data points. Um, and by, using, by doing that, you can do smooth transitions between the geographic layout, as you saw on the map, and a histogram like this. And, and so this is a pretty intriguing technique, uh, I think, which is kind of like easy to understand and follow along what is going on. Okay, and then the next section is only like, yeah, these are just fun maps that people of course use as where they use map, uh, maps as an, 
analogy. Like here, uh, you probably remember this uh, map of the island. Um, you can have the map of the internet in 2007 according to XKCD. You have the MySpace area and the IC North, Yahoo and Windows Live, uh, which is then updated in 2010 where fa uh, Facebook has taken up a big chunk and Farmel was still popular. Um, and Twitter and Skype uh, is uh, also appearing. Um, you can have maps that are not um, like on the inside of a building instead of having maps that are like geographical. So here is um, tracking of people and uh, the house cat um, where they were in um, uh, within a couple of hours in, in a living room uh, while the TV was on. Um, and then this is a map of, of London uh, in a very abstract sense. Okay. So that concludes maps, and now we're moving on to graphs. And for graphs, I want to start out with you trying to come up with graph visualization techniques yourself. So we'll run an exercise. I'll be handing this out. What you're supposed to be doing here is take a look at this data set. This is a co-author graph um, where we where I give you a couple of people um, and how many papers they co-author. And you should come up with two different designs uh, for representing this data. I'll give you 10 minutes in a group. And I also have scratch paper at the desk. Awesome. 
yeah, and then what do you run out of comments? Using alphabet. Or it's not alphabet. Or, sorry. Right, right, right. Yeah. And then also, it would be best to put the person with the most information. So you're going to go back to the And then the travel distance is going to last. So you like. I mean, like Bell's purpose, like, 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 like the ones with the highest and the ones with the most out. Yeah. And then you flip it on the other side. So it's the same thing. But the other side is the same Thank you. 
calculate how many papers they've done, and then there'd be connections between each bar uh, as they. Okay, and so you have essentially the like a, a donut chart segment that represents a person, and then a, a link between the uh, the, the, uh, the donut chart segments um, to show that they have four or something, and the width of that yeah. would correspond to the number of four authors. Yeah. Anybody else want to talk about there? Yeah. So what we had right now was like a matrix layout where we have each person uh, both as the column header and the row header, um, and then proportional to these attributes um, uh, show the um, uh, shows up like a glyph or a bar inside of those matrix cells. Somebody else had a, another idea. So basically, using each person as a circle, size of the circle will denote the number of uh, papers. Yeah. We've got lines connecting each of the two nodes, basically co-authors. Yeah. So line will have a, a markation like how many number of papers are being collaborated, and we could use the additional like the thickness of the line to show the I mean, variance in the papers. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, like no persons as bubble and the links and the link strengths as the number of co-written papers. So this is great. You kind of came up with the most important two graph visualization techniques. Uh, there are node link diagrams, which the pi segments are, like the, here the pi segments are nodes, in this case the bubbles were nodes, and matrix layouts. So this would be like a simple version without much encoding of the node link layout, right? Um, so I didn't, I didn't bother, like we can encode the, uh, the number of papers someone has written as the size or as the color or with an additional glyph in here. Um, and then I have labeled the edges. Uh, we could also do that by width or something like that. Who has, uh, who has like drawn something along this line? Just a ratio of hands. So that's the way we think about graphs, right? We have nodes and links between them. And then the second approach uh, is this matrix layout. Here, uh, again, I have uh, just like put the names in the columns, the names in the rows. Um, I haven't really thought much about the graphical encoding for those numbers. I could do a bar in here or a color shape uh, and the same in here. The one thing that I've done here is whenever people have ever written a paper together, uh, I have filled in uh, the, the square and then I have written a number on top of it. Again, there's many different ways of how we could encode this. But now let's look at those questions. How is Sean connected to Sylvia? So this is pretty easy to do, right? You simply trace Sean, uh -huh, Sylvia's over there, you kind of like look at where, what is the closest connection. So it's Sean, Alex, Mark, Sylvia. It's, one, it's the shortest path. Or if you don't want to have the shortest path, you could say Sean, Mariah, Alex, Mark, Sylvia. And this is, what, this is what's called a topology-based task. So we, we kind of traverse the graph mentally, we look for neighborhoods and so on. And so the longer the distance, uh, the tasks are uh, easy to do in, like, uh, in such a node link diagram. How is Sean connected to Niels? With this chart. Sean, Alex, Niels, yes. How did you do that? On the first chart. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> So this chart isn't really great at supporting this task, right? If you want to reason about path and something um, that is uh, not in the immediate neighborhood, it's tricky. Uh, is, like, if I ask a question like, is Mark a co-author of Mariah? No. That's easy to do in this chart, right? Neighborhood tasks are easy to do in this chart because I simply have to, like, look at, uh, I have Mariah here, and I want to know whether Mark is a co-author, I can simply scan over, and I can see exactly who are the co-authors. Um, are there, like, another question I could ask, is this network um, very dense? Is it almost everybody works with everybody? No. That's also easy to see here, 
Um, it's also, you can also see that here, but I would argue maybe that this representation um, is a little bit pre more precise in terms of uh, conveying this information. Who has the most co-authors? Alex. And you can also see this in this chart, but it kind of dominates uh, the view a little bit in this chart. And so those are the two main uh, visualization techniques um, for, for general graphs, these matrix layouts and the node link layouts. And I'll be talking about them uh, for a fair bit now. But let's take a step back. And why, why do we need graphs? What, what are we, why are graphs interesting? And I'm, I'm suspecting that I won't be getting much into graph visualization today uh, because we only have 20 minutes left. Um, but let's talk a little bit about why do we care about graphs. Graphs, like, it's not the standard data set, right? Like, what software would you use to visualize a graph? Other than D3, obviously. But, like, you can visualize tabular data with Excel or Tableau or something like that. But graphs are not as common, I would say, um, in, in the type of data that we have, but they're extremely common uh, in, in nature and in, extreme, in very many scenarios. So graphs, um, essentially the internet is a big graph and Google uses the PageRank algorithm, which is essentially um, a graph algorithm to uh, identify uh, important websites. Uh, we have integrated circuits which are based on graphs. We have um, street networks which are graphs. We have um, social networks, relationships, friendships networks, things like on Facebook or in actual real life or on um, uh, things like Twitter. What is the difference between the Twitter graph and the Facebook graph? Well, it's kind of directed because you can follow someone and someone might not follow you back, but in Facebook you're... Connected. Exactly, like Facebook has undirected edges. You, you, like mostly there's now you can follow like other pages and so on. But it's mostly you're friends with each other. There is not, I'm following you, you're not following me back, right? And so that's the big difference between uh, the Facebook and the Twitter graph. Um, here is a graph of Facebook where the nodes are geolocated. Uh, what is interesting, like what's an interesting thing about this network? Where's China? China isn't there, of course, because the internet uh, doesn't allow Facebook there. Uh, networks are super uh, important in biology. Um, that's a research area that I, I, I work in a lot, biology networks. For example, um, networks capture interactions between genes, uh, interactions between product, proteins, uh, interactions between proteins and chemical products, which are also drugs. And so like, if you want to understand how a drug that targets a specific protein, like a specific process in the cell, uh, you, it's not enough that you think about how it targets the one protein, but you need to understand what is going on in its environment, because if you shut that protein off, there's other things that are affected by that. And that's the reason why we have side effects of drugs, right? There's not, not, no, no, no protein or no biochemical process in our body does only one thing. Um, but if you have, for example, um, a drug for rheumatic arthritis uh, also leads to sensitivity to the skin uh, because the same protein that is responsible for like something that's going on in our skin is also responsible for rheumatic arthritis. And so if you want to understand these trends, uh, you need to understand graphs. Your ancestry is one big graph. The relations between you and your family, your parents, your grandparents, uh, your uncles, and back to like evolutionary times. Uh, phylogeny, the evolution, uh, the evolutionary relationships of life itself is one big tree. Uh, we have like these massive trees of life. Uh, here is just a very simplified version where we, where we divide it up into different kingdoms. Uh, our brain is one big graph, like one big uh, network of neurons that are connected to each other. Here we see uh, a couple of neurons that are connected to each other. Um, in a 3D representation, this is from a mouse brain, and here's a very abstract representation of the same graph for one selected neuron. Um, this is a network of biochemical relationships in the body. Um, this is actually a wallpaper poster um, that you can print out and put on your wall, and then you would have like a little uh, leaflet that tells you, okay, this particular uh, chemical compound is found in quadrant A5, and then you can find it um, and look for it and then see what is going on in this environment, what is happening. So these are very intricate, very detailed 
hand-drawn graphs that people actually use in pharmaceutical companies or in bio uh, research in general. Um, here's a, like a nice TED talk that I wanted to show five minutes off to kind of motivate um, how social networks impact our lives. begins about 15 years ago when I was a hospice doctor at the University of Chicago. And I was taking care of people who were dying and their families in the south side of Chicago. And I was observing what happened to people and their families over the course of their terminal illness. And in my lab, I was studying the widower effect, which is a very old idea in the social sciences, going back 150 years, known as dying of a broken heart. So when I die, my wife's risk of death can double, for instance, in the first year. And I had gone to take care of one particular patient, a woman who was dying of dementia. And in this case, uh, unlike this couple, she was being cared for by her daughter. And the daughter was exhausted from caring for her mother. And the daughter's husband, he also was uh, sick from his wife's exhaustion. And I was driving home one day, and I get a phone call from the husband's friend, calling me because he was depressed about what was happening to his friend. So here I get this call from this random guy that's having an experience that's being influenced by people at some social distance. And so I suddenly realized two very simple things. First, the widowhood effect was not restricted to husbands and wives. And second, it was not restricted to pairs of people. And I started to see the world in a whole new way, like pairs of people connected to each other. And then I realized that these individuals would be connected into foursomes with other pairs of people nearby. And that in fact, these people were embedded in other sorts of relationships, marriage and spousal and friendship and other sorts of ties. And that in fact, these connections were vast. And that we were all embedded in this broad set of connections with each other. So I started to see the world in a completely new way. And I became obsessed with this. I became obsessed with how it might be that we're embedded in these social networks and how they affect our lives. So social networks are these intricate things of beauty. And they're so elaborate and so complex and so ubiquitous, in fact, that one has to ask what purpose they serve. Why are we embedded in social networks? I mean, how do they form? How do they operate? And how do they affect us? And so my first topic with respect to this was not death, but obesity. And I suddenly, it had become trendy to speak about the obesity epidemic. And along with my collaborator, James Fowler, we began to wonder whether obesity really was epidemic and could it spread from person to person like the four people I discussed earlier. So this is a slide of some of our initial results. It's 2,200 people in the year 2000. Every dot is a person. We make the dot size proportional to people's body size. So bigger dots are bigger people. And in addition, if your body size, if your BMI, your body mass index is above 30, if you're clinically obese, we also color the dots yellow. So if you look at this image right away, you might be able to see that there are clusters of obese and non-obese people in the image. But the visual complexity is still very high. It's, it's not obvious exactly what's going on. In addition, some questions are immediately raised. How much clustering is there? Is there more clustering than would be due to chance alone? How big are the clusters? How far do they reach? And most importantly, what causes the clusters? So we did some mathematics to study the size of these clusters. This here shows on the y-axis the increase in the probability that a person is obese, given that a social contact of theirs is obese. And on the x-axis, the degrees of separation between the two people. And on the far left, you see the purple line. It says that if your friends are obese, your risk of obesity is 45% higher. And the next bar over, the orange line, says if your friend's friends are obese, your risk of obesity is 25% higher. And then the next line over says, if your friend's friend's friend, someone you probably don't even know is obese, your risk of obesity is 10% higher. And it's only when you get to your friend's 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 that there's no longer a relationship between that person's body size and your own body size. Well, what might be causing this clustering? There are at least three possibilities. One possibility is that as I gain weight, it causes you to gain weight, a kind of induction, a kind of spread from person to person. Another possibility, very obvious, is homophily, or birds of a feather flock together. Here, I form my tie to you because you and I share a similar body size. 
And the last possibility is what is known as confounding, because it confounds our ability to figure out what's going on. And here the idea is not that I, my weight gain is causing more weight gain, nor that I preferentially form a tie with you because you and I share the same body size, but rather that we share a common exposure to something like a, like a health club that makes us both lose weight at the same time. And when we studied these data, we found evidence for all of these things, including for induction. And we found that if your friend becomes obese, it increases your risk of obesity by about 57% in the same given time period. And there can be many mechanisms for this effect. One possibility is that your friends say to you something like, you know, they adopt a behavior that spreads to you, like they say, let's go have muffins and beer, which is a terrible combination. Uh, but you, you adopt that combination, and then you, you start gaining weight like them. And another more subtle possibility is, is that they start gaining weight, and it changes your ideas of what an acceptable body size is. And here, what's spreading from person to person is not a behavior, but rather a norm. An idea is spreading. OK, so this is just an illustration of how social networks influence our lives in many different ways. So let's talk a little bit about graph theory fundamentals in the last 10 minutes. Um, and uh, there's a nice book that's online. This is by Laszlo Barabasi, who is kind of the, um, the scientist that essentially invented the field of network science. And so here's a link to that, which uh, is a pretty interesting book. Um, graph theory goes back to the Königsberger bridge problem. And the, the problem that um, this um, was formulated somewhere around the time in 1736 is uh, Königsberg is a city in Germany. Um, and the question that people are talking about is, can you take a walk through the city, which was bisected by a river that branched? Can you take a walk through the city and with it visit every landmass without crossing a bridge twice? Try to figure it out. Um, depends on where you start from. If you don't start from the island, there is no way you can um, you will leave out a bridge, or you will take a bridge twice in the island. Because uh, there's five bridges. Yes, but uh, so you want to criss cross every bridge exactly once, sorry, that is imprecisely formulated. And it's not possible, actually. Um, and so uh, Leonard Euler uh, formulated why this is not possible. First, he showed uh, that it doesn't matter uh, what, which path you take on land. Right? So, how you walk through the streets is irrelevant to answer this particular question. So we can abstract the land masses to vertices or to nodes. Um, and then we can abstract the bridges um, as edges connecting those land masses. And so this would be um, the graph that corresponds to this Königsberg, um, the city of Königsbergs. And the edges here would be the corresponding bridges across them. And then he showed that it's only possible with graphs with at most two nodes with an odd number of links. Um, and so this graph has four nodes with odd numbers of links, and therefore that's not possible. Um, and so this is the first time that somebody has abstracted a problem into uh, a graph theory formulation. And that's kind of what we think of as the first graph theory problem. Um, if we talk about the graph in an abstract sense, uh, we define a graph as uh, G of VE, uh, where V um, are vertices, which we also call nodes, and a set of edges, E, which we also call links connecting these vertices. Uh, the words graphs and networks are typically used interchangeably. Um, what happens is that when you say graph uh, to somebody who is not a, like a computer scientist or a visualization person, they think of like a chart. Um, network is usually the safer word if you want to talk to the general public. Um, my distinction that I make is that I use the word graph if I talk about graph theory and the general graph, and I talk about networks if I talk about something specific. So it's a social network, but it's a graph traversal algorithm. Um, so there's a couple of different classes of graphs. A simple graph is a graph which contains no multi-edges and no loops. So without the orange edges here, uh, that would be a simple graph. With the orange edges, it would be uh, not a simple graph. So we have self loops and we have uh, edges, like multiple edges connecting two nodes. Uh, a directed graph is one that is discerns between edges from A to B and B to A. 
so this is exactly the difference between Facebook and Twitter that we mentioned uh, earlier. Um, a directed graph is Twitter, uh, Facebook is an undirected graph. Um, a hypergraph is a graph which edges connecting any number of vertices. Hypergraph is basically just a fancy word of saying there is a relationship uh, between like multiple nodes at the same time. I like to think of those hyper edges also as sets. So if you think about like a social network, um, you could say all of your friends who are also at the University of Utah share a hyper edge with you. So you belong to one common thing, um, and this is also a set relationship on these graph nodes. Um, there are uh, graphs that can be unconnected, so it doesn't mean that uh, just because you have different segments of a graph or there's no path between them, um, it is still a graph. Um, and then there's special points in the graph, for example, an articulation point, and the definition of an articulation point is uh, a vertex which, if deleted, would break up a connected graph into multiple subgraphs. Like here is an example, if I deleted the red point here, um, I would break up the graph into two graphs. And I don't think there is another articulation point in this graph. Um, a biconnected graph is a graph without articulation points. So here I could delete any vertex uh, without breaking up the graph. Um, and a bipartite graph is a graph which vertices I can partition between into two independent sets. Uh, and there is no edges within the set. So in this example, there is never an edge from a circle to a circle uh, or from a square to a square. There's always only an edge from a circle to a square. Uh, these are actually quite common uh, as well, and they're also an interesting visualization problem. Um, you probably all know what a tree is. Uh, a tree is just a graph with no cycles. Uh, or you can also include the definition of a root in a tree. Um, so a so in this case, like the right here is a tree that doesn't have a defined root. Most commonly, we think about trees having a root and then looking something like this. And there's also a recursive definition of a tree, uh, of a tree which is as a collection of nodes which contain a root node and zero to n subtrees. Um, and the subtrees are connected to the root by an edge. And so here, like we have a root and then subtrees, and each of these subtrees has a root and then subtrees and so on. Um, trees can be ordered. Uh, typically, we don't think of graphs as ordered, but we use ordered trees in uh, many algorithms applications. So in this case here, um, there is a, if we consider this tree to be ordered, we wouldn't consider those two trees to be equal because the order of um, E and F here is different, um, as you can see here. Um, for a, like a general graph, um, those are, if you just look at the topology, those are identical. And there is actually uh, over a thousand named graph classes, um, clicks and trees and bipartite graphs and networks and hypergraphs and so on. And there is whole books on just on graph classes. Um, so if you're interested in this kind of thing, uh, there, uh, you can take a look at this book. One very important measure about graphs are degrees. Um, the degree of a node is the number of action, uh, edges uh, uh, for a node. So here in this example, um, the node 1 has degree 1, node 2 has degree 3, node 3 has degree 2, node 4 has degree 2, because this is how many edges um, the graph has. Like an important measure about the graph is its average degree uh, and its degree distribution. Um, and what, like here we see the degree distribution of this graph, we see that there is like uh, one node of degree 1, uh, or 25% like of the nodes in this case, have degree 1, 50% uh, have degree 2, 25% have degree 3. This circle here, we have 100% of uh, nodes have degree 2. Uh, what do you think that like social networks, uh, what is the degree distribution of a social network, just intuitively? So many networks that we observe uh, in real life, they have very uneven degree distribution. Um, there are central hubs uh, in these networks. There's like you probably have a couple of friends who have thousands of friends on Facebook, right? Uh, but most of your friends probably have like a, only 100 or 200 or 300. Um, so here's a protein interaction network, um, and that shows us this uh, this principle of what's called preferential attachment um, and uh, this, this, this idea of a scale-free network. Also, um, so here is uh, the degrees. Uh, um, the degree of the nodes 
um, and the percent of nodes that have that degree. And you can see that about half of the nodes have a degree of one or two uh, in this proto-interaction uh, network. I can't really read it whether this is one or two, uh, but probably that's one. And then about 20% have a degree of two, um, and so on. And so this is kind of like a, um, a, a logarithmic um, effect that we see here, um, that very few nodes um, have very high number, uh, a very high number of degree. Um, degree is a measure of local importance. And this is a network that I'll be using a lot to illustrate a couple of concepts. Uh, this is the um, Les Miserables um, network of characters that, that appear together in, in the book. Um, and you see Valjean here is the main character and he appears with lots of the actors, um, but not with everyone directly, right? Valjean never directly interacts with those people out here. Uh, he only indirectly interacts with them through Muriel. Um, so degree is a measure of local importance, but a degree doesn't necessarily tell us how important a network is in the global network, right? Because like, if you think about, for example, the internet, it would be easy to fake the degree of a network, but it would be harder to fake something like betweenness centrality. Uh, betweenness centrality is a measure of a network uh, of how many shortest paths pass through a single node. And this is like a good measure of the overall relevance of a node in a graph. And so here I'm plotting the degree betweenness centrality of these nodes. And so how betweenness centrality works is, like I'm looking for every node uh, to every other node, what is the shortest path, and then I keep track of how many shortest paths go through a certain node. And you can see the nodes here are, are sized by the between the centrality, and there's a lot of shortest paths that go through Valjean. So this is a good measure for the overall relevance of a node in the graph. Um, here's a comparison for, the, for this, those two networks uh, in terms of the histogram of the degrees. And you can see uh, for the histogram between the centrality that we have even on the more extreme uh, distribution, that the majority of nodes in the network have a low uh, between the centrality, and then we have a couple of high outliers here. Um, path and distances. A path is a route along links, um, and the path lengths is the number of links that, cont that, are, that is contained in that path. Um, very often we care about shortest path. Um, shortest path connect nodes I and J with the smallest number of links, um, and we also can define the diameter of a graph is the longest shortest path within G. So between any combination of nodes, which is the longest shortest path between them, that's the diameter of a graph, and that's also an important graph measure. And that's kind of the very short graph theory introduction, which is exactly a 320, and then we'll talk about visualization techniques for graphs. Uh, and well, next week we have Tuesday. Remember, there's a mandatory peer feedback session. And then on Thursday, uh, we have a guest lecture who will be talking about medical visualization, um, or not medical visualization, but molecular animation, uh, Jenna Diwasa. Um, so uh, please, um, Tuesday is mandatory. On Thursday, please make sure you come. A, she gives a great talk, and B, it looks really bad if there's only very few people for a guest lecture. OK, thanks, guys.